This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, we declare which Super Bowl commercial came out on top and why the worst ones capture Hollywood to a T. And that's not a compliment. We speak with rapper High Res, the politically charged musician who's behind too many viral videos to count, and why he changed dramatically in his approach to his music. And we see yet another sign of Me Too's depressing and yet oddly welcome decline. If that sounds like a contradiction in terms, well, I'll explain it all. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto Podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. All right, before the show gets officially started, I wanted to just ask you to subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. We've got new episodes every Wednesday, plus bonus episodes coming in too. And if you like what you hear, could you give us a review over at iTunes? Every kind word, every syllable, well, it helps. I watch the Super Bowl for the commercials. We hear that every year, and there's some truth to it. Madison Avenue pulls out all the stops when it comes to the big game day. They bring us the biggest commercials around, and that's, I think, the problem. Huge celebrities, immortal athletes, endless special effects, and it's exhausting. It's like shotgunning a Slurpee and then watching all those Fast and Furious movies back to back, to back, to back to back. Hey, here's a secret. Less is more. Simple, but effective. You've got 30 seconds. You've got to make them count. But those lessons are lost when it comes to Super Bowl Sunday every year. Does anyone actually remember the commercials that we just watched? What were the brands behind them? Do you want to see them again? Why would a company spend millions, and they do spend millions, and then just flood the screen with sound and fury, signifying nothing? Look at me quoting Shakespeare. I'm all smart and stuff. It's why this particular commercial, well, it's my favorite. It's got a great running gag, and it plays it to perfection. You've got an ageless movie star who's in on the joke. I present to you... Christopher Walken for BMW. Nice ride. It's the real deal. 100% electric. It's the real deal. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Enjoy your coffee. Careful, it's hot. Thanks. Your dog's so cute. Mm, yeah. Ooh, so adorable. Yeah, wow. Yeah, right. You both know it's the man who makes the clothes. Oh, you know, you look nice. Okay, we're done. And if you like that spot, go rewatch his incredible video for Fatboy Slim's weapon of choice. It puts me in a good mood and it puts a silly smile on my face every single time. It is perfection. But what's not perfect? Well, you know, look around at Hollywood. I think that they follow that Super Bowl model. Big stars, bigger budgets, biggest special effects around. Again, it's exhausting in audiences, I think. I think they're exhausted by it. I mean, have you seen the box office grosses lately? Oh my, not good, not good. Both Hollywood and the biggest brands around should learn a lesson here, should tighten their belts, dial back on all those crazy special effects, and just tell a story. Who knows? That old school approach just might work. Here's your movie trivia question of the week. What song played again and again in the 1993 comedy classic Groundhog Day? And who sang it? The answer's at the end of the show. Life has a funny way of red-pilling our friends and neighbors. Last week's show, we talked to Five for Fighting's John Andrasik. He talked about how the latest headlines made him into a protest singer. That wasn't his direction. It wasn't his goal. It wasn't his dream. He didn't have a choice. Well, now it's High Res's turn. The rapper went viral a few years ago with a killer McDonald's rap. But he sang a lot of, about a lot of things over the years, but he wasn't political. It was more just kind of basic hip-hop. And then life got in the way. Tragedy struck his family. He lost a cousin at the Parkland High School shooting in Florida. 
But he also watched how the culture reacted to that tragedy. It woke him up in a way. Later, he couldn't believe how many Americans just gave over their freedom during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm with him there. So now he's rapping about real life, real issues, the headlines, including his latest song, Anti-Everything. I support the current causes. I have empathy and manners. I got pronouns in my bio. Pray for countries in my banner. I can't wait to get my seven shot. It's written in my planner. I don't use emojis. They appropriate those who are tanner. Wait a minute. You didn't post a black square for Black Lives Matter. If you don't wear a mask, that makes you an anti-masker. If you don't get the vax, that makes you an anti-vaxxer. If you don't watch Full House, that makes you anti any tanner. Wait, you don't listen to Nelly? You're anti- There's many things to love about high res. For me, as a solopreneur, I love that he's a self-made man. He's built this on his own. But now he's actually teaming up with a record label, Based Records. They're an unwoke record company, and God bless him. Iris is serious, he's silly, he's funny. He makes us think about things in ways we just weren't thinking about before. I mean, even if you're not a big hip-hop fan, I'm not a huge hip-hop fan myself, I think you're going to love his music. I know I do. Meet the mind behind all those great viral raps, hi Rez. Hi Rez, thanks for joining the show. You know, I'm always curious about how artists start their careers. I don't want to get too in the weeds with it, but you're a rapper, you're having success. Talk about that moment where you thought, this isn't just what I love to do, it doesn't just reflect my talent, but there's an audience for it, there's a hunger for it. Was there a specific moment or a, a song that went, went viral, just... Briefly touch on that and, and how it kind of launched your career. Yeah, yeah. First off, thanks for having me. And sure. um, I've been making music since I'm um, about 13 years old. I'm, I'm 30 now, so more than half my life I've been making music. And I would say even even about half it since 15, I've been doing it professionally. Um, as far as, you know, I think the biggest thing that happened to me was when I was um, early 20s, I did, a, um, I did a viral video, a viral song um, or rap in, in a McDonald's in Times Square where mm-hmm. I rapped the order. And I went super viral. Like it's still to this day, one of the biggest uh, viral videos on Facebook. This was before, you know, I was doing anything, I guess, somewhat controversial. You know, you could push poison in uh, big pharma things and you could push fast <laughs> fast food on your fans. But God forbid you start telling them about, uh, you know, sovereignty and, uh, you know, <laughs> God and, and things like that. But um, long story short, yeah, I think it was the McDonald's rap that really um, pushed me to realize like, OK, and, and a lot of people around me. That pushed them to realize, okay, I guess this is this is legitimate. This is a career. Um, I never I never set out um, with the goal of like, you know, I'm gonna make a ton of money and I'm gonna I'm gonna be the most famous guy on earth. Um, I just really loved hip hop uh, specifically, and um, you know, in the last few years especially, I really saw it as an outlet to express what was going on in not just my life, which is kind of what I would I would always do with hip hop. It was always about my life and me and my family and my relationships and things like that. But the last few years, I really um, you know thought more outward. And and I started using my music for, I guess, um, you know, a, bit, a, a bigger picture. No, I, I know you lost your cousin in the Parkland shooting a few years ago, and you were not so happy about the the lockdowns and all thing going on with the mandates. Oh, yeah. Obviously, I I, I, oh, yeah. I feel the same way. Were these all these different cultural moments in your life? Did that turn the key? Turn you into a different kind of performer, where you focus more on political and cultural matters. Was that was that the sort of the natural outgrowth of that, or was it a, something else that changed your focus? Yeah, no, I, you 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 hit it on the head. I think those are the two um, those are two of um, the bigger defining moments in my career, along with kind of um, you know smaller moments um, of you know bad management, you know dealing with with normal stuff you you see in the industry like you know drug use and and. Um, you know, just getting depression, anxiety, getting lost along the way, you know, I think people you can't trust bad, bad label deals. So but yeah, as far as the big more defining moments, I would I would definitely chalk them up to uh, the lockdowns and and the, med- you know, the medical mandates, as well as my cousin uh, being, uh, you know, uh, killed in a school shooting. And I just really opened my eyes to the idea that left and right are not as uh, absolute and black and white as as CNN or Fox, you know, made them out to made even me out to believe I was always open minded and, and, and thinking kind of differently than my friends. But I still fell into and sometimes to this day, I still fall, you know, victim to, you know, uh, believing certain uh, propaganda and, and, and falling victims to certain agendas. And, you know, obviously, I'm not a perfect human, I'm still trying to become better every day. But I always thought critically, and those two were were big defining moments in my career that made me say, 
okay, you know what? I, I don't really care what fans I lose. I don't really care what money I lose, what endorsements I lose. You know, I really feel like I have a bigger message um, from God instead of just let me put out this kind of bubble gummy, you know, stuff that I was doing for a while uh, just to kind of get clicks and make money. And imagine your audience changes as well when you make that shift. What's been the most profound part of that change? What, what do you hear from people? Uh, is the connection that your music has with your audience, is that different as well? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, having started music when I'm 13, it's always cool to see a select few fans that have stuck by me the whole way. Um, and, and then, you know, other fans that still have stuck by me through a, through a large portion of my career, you know, it might not be day one, but you know, if, if you were there on day two, that's, that's just as <laughs> good in my eyes. Um, but it's, it's, it's really cool to see fans that have been sticking around for a long time. And it's cool to see the new fans that are like, you know, I, you know, with, without your music, you know, I wouldn't have got, I wouldn't have got through the lockdowns in my country. I lived in Australia. I live in Canada. You know, your music kept me sane during, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I always have, um, you know, to answer your question, I've always had the same sort of um, structure when it comes to how I connect with my fans and, and how they connect with me, because there's always been a, a, an, an element of God. There's always been an element of faith, um, even if it's not necessarily, I'm Jewish, but even if it's not necessarily my my faith or, or, or the Christian faith or the Muslim faith, it's always been, um, you know, a, an element of faith and, and spirituality and God and always overcoming difficulties and overcoming, um, you know, struggles, because that's kind of been my life, you know, no matter if it's a, a small roadblock or a big, a big struggle in my life, I've always had this defining uh, moment and these kind of embedded in my DNA, this kind of characteristic where no matter if I'm at, you know, wit's end, I'm at the end of the road, I'm at the end of my, of, of my rope, I guess per se. And there's been always something in my mind that told me to fight and told me to battle back. And I've never been one to listen to like Tony Robbins or like these, these kind of, uh, you know, these motivational speakers, but for whatever reason, I've always, I guess, had this internal motivational speaker. I, I, maybe it's, I guess it's God that's just been always helping me along the way. And I think a lot of fans can relate to that, whether they're, yeah, I have atheist fans that, that are like, you know, I, I really resonate with your message and I have, um, you know, fans of all different walks of life that resonate with my message. So it's been cool to connect with my fans through all the different, um, uh, you know, kind of through the whole journey and all the different steps in my career, but it's always been kind of the same, the same way, just, just, you know, in a more mature way now, you know, it, you can't connect with grown, you know, men and women when I'm, when I'm 15 years old, how can I relate to them? I'm, I'm rapping about like taking tests and like smoking <laughs> weed and like having anxiety because of uh, a breakup or something, you know, that's what my music was at the time. Uh, well, you know, obviously I'm dumbing it down, but, you know, it's really been cool to grow with my fans because I remember when I first started, I was looking at, you know, the Justin Bieber's of the world or whoever I'm looking at um, people around me and, and, you know, that I was compared, not, not him, but other people that I was compared to. And I always noticed that a lot of people, they had, um, you know, specific niche fan base, even if they're billionaires, it was always 13 year old girls or 48 year old men or just Christians or just, you know, so it's really been cool to um, slowly, brick by brick, grow a, a massively, um, you know, wide audience of, of, of very diverse people. You knew a song is anti-everything. It's got a lot to say, obviously, but it's also hypnotic. It's a great song. It works on that level as well. Is that a challenge for you as you get more culturally significant, as you're pushing into these boundaries and these areas that are complicated, where you don't want to lose sight of the music, the reason why you're here but at the same right. time, you want to send a message. You want to open people's minds. Is is that a, a new complication or a new wrinkle, or do you find it it flows organically? Um, I think specifically, it's a good question. I think specifically when I'm making the records themselves, it's not an issue. I, I can create a record about, you know, like I said, I've worked with McDonald's. I've done corporate gigs. I, I can make a song about, you know, anything. And uh, it, it comes extremely easy. I'm blessed in that regard. But um, to your point, it 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 is a bit more difficult to balance um, you know, the, the idea of coming, cause I love to make all types of music and my fans love me for different types of music, just like anyone loves it. I love Drake for this, or I love, you know, him for, I love blah, blah, blah for that. You know, I, I miss the old version of him. I love the new version. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've got, I've gotten that my whole career and that doesn't bother me anymore, but I've learned to uh, understand that, you know, my, my more happy go lucky music resonates with uh, this person and, and my more uh, motivational music res resonates with that person. So I think that in, in that regard, because I, I have never really 
um, succumb to the peer pressure of, of, of boxing myself into one box. I've been told that I'm only this way. And then I always break out of that box every single time. I've gone viral dozens of times for polar opposite reasons. And, you know, I've never been the one creatively to be like, hey, I know how successful I can become if I just stick to one thing forever, because that's what anyone does, right? That's what Amazon does. That's what Walmart does. That's what any big brand does is, you know, they stick to something and they do it over and over and over. And just creatively, I don't want to feel like that robot, but um, it, it is a great question. I think individually, no, I don't have problems um, kind of flowing when, when it comes to this new sociopolitical content. But I do uh, get a sense of urgency when it comes to releasing music that I feel like I don't want to release too many of these in a row because mm. then people will be like, oh, this he changed now. In reality, it's like you know, I, I'm sitting on tons of pop music. I'm sitting on tons of love music. I'm sitting on tons of sociopolitical music, motivational music, gym music. And I think it's more so the release, the release schedule and the way it comes out that affects the fans more so than the actual uh, art itself. And that I, I deal, I, I have issues more, so, more so with the business side and the rollouts than the creative aspect. When I listen to your music, what catches me and what turns me is the the humor. I, it's it, it, you'll be you know knee deep in a song, and all of a sudden there's a line that's extremely funny. And I feel like yeah. the podcasts I listen to, it's often those that have a humorous element. Andrew Clavin is one someone I really revere, right. and he's so funny and so succinct. Is is that talk about? deploying that humor because I think yeah. it truly does break down people and also opens them up where you're listening to a song maybe if you're not even, not even agreeing with the lyrics and all of a sudden you're smiling and I, I just think yeah. that like it's like a, a valve pops open and and all of a sudden the listener is able to appreciate or absorb a lesson or absorb a, a thought in a way that they couldn't it, it, just get your thoughts on that yes so I appreciate you bringing that up because when I first started making music when I was 13 and, and, you know, when I'm 13, I the only people that are listening to it is like my mom and like my <laughs> two friends, you know, <laughs> and um, the music I started making when I was 13, before I ever made a serious song in my life was always comedy. It was always parody. It was always, a, it, you know, it, was, it would be a, almost like Weird Al in a sense, but it much, much less professional and much less put together, I guess, at least at the time. And um, I always, you know, was the class clown. I always really, before music even, I was, I was making, you know, people laugh and making people smile through, through jokes, even if they were extremely, I, I've always been a fan, even as a Jew, like I've been a fan of, of the darkest jokes you could think of, you know, even if it has to do with me, because I believe that jokes, you know, nothing's off limits when it comes to, it's a joke. If it's truly a joke, it's a joke. And um, I think we've come so far away from comedy. And I believe that comedians hold a, a very powerful um, key right now into the culture war and not just musicians, obviously musicians do too. And parents and mothers and fathers, obviously a lot of people play a big role in this, but I think comedians totally, um, Dave Chappelle specifically with that, with the, um, over the last few years with his comedy special, I think that was an extremely defining moment in culture where people were protesting his thing outside of Netflix. And all he did was make a trans joke, but the way he brought it fully together was, hey, you know, I, I was very good friends with this trans person. I don't know if you know what I'm referring to. Oh yeah, but, yeah absolutely. Um, I was very good friends with this trans person and blah, blah, blah. And he would basically was talking about tri the tribal mentalities and tribal thinking and say like, like he, the way he, the way he put it all together was so brilliant. Basically saying, I loved this trans friend of mine more than you did as a community. And the way he put that together was so brilliant. And um, I think that that was a very defining moment for, it's funny because me and my wife actually noticed after that special and after Netflix renewed him again. And after they basically said, no, 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 no we're keeping, uh, we're keeping Dave up. And same with Joe Rogan on Spotify. They say, no, 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 we're keeping him up because we know these people make a lot of money. But beyond that, they have good intentions. We know their hearts. We know they're good people. And I think that was a very defining moment because after that, a lot of comedians started getting real confident again. And I noticed that, you know, uh, from uh, Andrew Schultz to many people just started saying words that we haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> and they started saying, you know, statements and sentiments that we hadn't heard in a long time. But um, to, to answer your question regarding the music, I, I appreciate that you noticed that because it's been a main goal of mine. My wife knows all the time. We we discuss this all the time that like I, I was desperate for years and years and years for my fans to, to know my humor, but I wasn't able to put it in the music until recently. And I'm super grateful that um, that, that, that you notice it, that fans are noticing it, that I'm able to put out successful music 
that's serious but comedy at the same time because I finally feel like now that I just hit 30, you know, I, at 16, I wanted to be so um, uh, well, I wanted people to understand my struggles and, and you know, who doesn't want to be validated in some sense, right? That's, that's a big issue with what's going on in the world, obviously. I think that people seek validation a little too much, but I think everyone seeks some, some form of validation and uh, comedy in my music is, is something that I've, I've really, um, I guess, strive to, to, to put out. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Mission accomplished. I was reading, you have a, uh, a pinned uh, tweet on your X account and you talk about not being able to perform in Germany because of your, <laughs> what you say politically. Uh, I don't know if this, you want to get into that or just more specifically, have you faced other repercussions for saying what you say, doing what you do, singing what you sing? I, I, Cause I, I, you know, I, I talk to a lot of comedians who find their jokes being punished on social media. Uh, I, I, a comedian I just spoke to, I won't mention his name, said that a, a club owner wouldn't have him on you know, at his club because he differs politically from him. What, <laughs> have you faced that or is it just the Germany situation? No, I faced it in, um, I faced it in Atlanta. I faced it in, in, in many cities um, in America as well. I think the Germany one was just a defining moment for me to realize mm-hmm. how absurdly over, um, like an, like an overcorrection, you know, we've reached, we've reached this over civilized point where, you know, they, they struggled so hard, I guess, to, to kind of denounce themselves and renounce themselves from anything related remotely to Nazism and, 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 um, you know, what, uh, nationalism, whatever it is to the point where they didn't bar me from performing in clubs in Germany because I'm Jewish, but it just shows you how backward it is that as a conservative Jew, I can't perform in a place, you know what I mean? And yeah, I'm not, yeah. the, I'm not the only one. I know, I know Ben Shapiro. I know there's many people in my position. It's like, it's like, we're like young professional Jews. We're not like, we're not running around like, you know, preaching like anti-Jewish rhetoric. It's just crazy because, um, you know, that's, that goes to the whole hate speech thing and, 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 and censorship. I learned that, especially over the last few years, when it, when it came to my doorstep that, you know, there's no such thing truly, obviously, if you're, if you're calling to action some sort of violence, I'm always against that. I'm always opposed to that. But I think you can find that you're, um, I guess, uh, oppressed in some sort of way, and you are some sort of victim if you look hard enough. Because you know, I live in Orlando now, and the Pulse nightclub shooting uh, many years ago. That you know, so somebody went and shot up people because they were gay. And then just as recent as yesterday, um, Joella, you know, the, the church gets shot up. You know, so so you can get shot up for being Christian or Catholic. You know, mosques have been shot up, uh, temples in Pittsburgh, and 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 other ones more recently have been shot up. So. Anyone who looks hard enough, trans people say, you know, so anyone who looks hard enough will find that they can be a victim and act like a victim and they can find some sort of victim mentality because it exists out there, depending on your algorithm, depending on the media you consume, depending on how successful you are as a person. And I think that that's the biggest pandemic we've dealt with is is victim mentality and kind of this oppression Olympics. And um, I know I just I talk and talk forever to you. No, yeah, it's I really okay. kind of I veered off your question, but um, I think that that's where it comes down to it. Whether whether we're talking Atlanta, you know, a club that won't let me in Atlanta, or we're talking clubs, multiple clubs, and and venues and booking agents that won't book me in Europe, specifically Germany. You know, it doesn't matter who we're discussing. I think it comes down to um, this overcorrection and this over civilization of, of, of political correctness and everybody, no one wants to offend anybody and everybody wants to be the most oppressed and everyone wants to be some sort of um, protected group and protected class. And I think, I hope we're reaching a point in society where the pendulum is swinging back. I just fear as you and many logical, rational people fear that it swings a little too far. I, I, I like to ho- hope we can meet in the middle somewhere. Yeah, it's a great point. I think an overcorrection might be as, as, damaging as what we're experiencing right now. You know, uh, to, to just a kind of personal observation, I was a failed art major. I basically manufactured my career as a journalist, and then I went solo, and now I'm a solopreneur as a right-leaning movie critic, et cetera. And I, I feel like a lot of people like you are doing a similar path and that there's no template for you. There's no roadmap. And again, the media is not going to fall in love with you. It's not going to promote you or give you the kind of right. buzz that you that you need, you know, that in, in a sense. So everything you're doing is, is self-made in a way. Is that is that accurate? And how, how have you taught yourself these skills? Because obviously you've got musical skills. You're a smart person. But that doesn't mean you're a business person. I mean, it's a whole different skill right. set to do this successfully. Can you just real briefly talk on that uh, about that so, that uh, evolution? Yeah, absolutely. So it was uh, it was a lot of a lot of money lost, a lot of falling <laughs> oh, on my ass. 
um, a lot of a lot of bad um, you know situations contractually. Um, I learned so much. I used to have a lawyer on on retainer. You know, I had many people on retainer when I couldn't afford them, but I didn't realize how stupid that was that you're giving you know, a percentage of, of your career to somebody who you could easily pay a couple thousand dollars to, which I only recently realized. Um, I ha I've had people pirate my music. I've had people, uh, you know, I, I, we're talking collectively hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably over 15 years, which to, which to, to multi multimillionaires and billionaires is nothing. But to somebody who only makes hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's a lot of money, obviously. And to somebody who comes from literally nothing, I, I came from zero fans, zero dollars, um, you know, I, I used to live in, in, I never went to college. My, my wife did. So I kind of was, I kind of got my college experience, but I, I used to live in a house with like seven roommates. I would pay like $300 in rent. And in order to even make that rent, I used to have to do one or two features a month for 150 bucks, 200 bucks. You want me on a hook? Um, because maybe I had one or two videos that was going a little bit viral at the time. So it's literally just trial and error, extreme amounts of, 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 of lost friendships and lost sleep and lost money. And um, it really is one of those true uh, stories of just kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, I, I've had five managers in my career. I've had five lawyers in my career. And the only thing that's remained constant is, is, is basically me, God, and my wife. That, that, uh, that's an interesting story. And, but you know, the bottom line is you're doing this all on your terms. You're allowed to have your voice. You're allowed to follow your passions. And I think if you had gone in a different direction, that's not exactly going to be the route you take. So uh, for all the perils and all the money lost, what you're ending up is, is a more, a more honest and authentic you. Uh, one last question, you know, we're seeing some more you can call them conservative, maybe right-leaning, maybe even just libertarian. But these are artists in the cultural space, and they're making a difference. I mean, Oliver Anthony comes to mind. Sound of right. Freedom shook up everything a few months back. Do you sense that there's a, a, a shift from, a, from an artistic point of view, a cultural point of view, where even people who may not be necessarily right-leaning are saying, hey, I, I like this rap song. It's got it's something about it. It's, it, seems, uh, you know, it seems raw. It seems authentic. Are you, do you see this a, a change afoot, culturally speaking? Yeah, totally. Um, my phone's ringing in the background. I don't know how loud it is. Or if it's I didn't even hear it. You're good. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. You don't hear it. That's good. Um, yeah, I, that's a great question, and, and I'm really – infatuated by by that 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 idea because I often think about um, counterculture and 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 how it plays a role in in politics and and money and you know just just everything just how, how we treat each other um, and I think first of all Oliver Anthony that, that was that was an extreme turning point I also feel in in uh, in music and now you see a lot of these rappers not not because of him obviously now you see a lot of these rappers that were scared in 2016 to say they supported trump or 2020 that they supported trump now they're all of a sudden they're like eh, i don't really care i don't care <laughs> if i lose fans i don't care and it's really cool to see that that cultural evolution um like you said it's not even i think people are recognizing that trump doesn't necessarily represent republicans and he doesn't necessarily represent obviously people can make this argument and i'm sure you can find enough uh, evidence to say he works for this or he does that or he's promoted something that I hate or he's uniparty. You know, every you have these black pill people that love to find the worst in everybody and find the issues of the world. I really hate nihilist, you know, not nihilism. And I think that without faith, you literally have no reason to live. You have no reason to get up. Um, so I really I really hate um you know, getting the attention of those black pill people when it comes to my fans. I think most of my fans um, kind of understand what you were saying. They're libertarians or they're former liberals or they still are liberals or they're right leaning or left leaning or or they just feel they're apolitical or they're homeless when it comes to politics. And I think that, um, you know, my music is really representative of a lot of those people that are just you know, the, the Zubies of the world, the Joe Rogans of the world, the people that are pretty logical and rational and try not to, you know, to, to throw blame at, I'm going to blame the blacks. I'm going to blame the Jews. I'm going to blame the left. I'm going to blame the right. It just feels extremely intellectually lazy and um, low IQ of people to just kind of shift the blame. And especially when they're miserable, they, they tend to shift blame. Yeah. And I think that just, uh, we're totally at a, at a, at a, at a, at a shift count, you know, counterculture wise, we're totally at a shift. And I think it's a brilliant, um, you know, it's like, it's almost like a Renaissance in a sense. We're at, we're, at a, we're at a new a new renaissance. Well, I, I, just to wrap things up, you mentioned uh, a niche a little while ago, kind of reaching out to a very small group. What you're discussing is not a small group. It's a large group, right. and it's getting bigger and bigger. And I'm so glad right. to have you on the show and to talk about this and that you're doing music that really does reach out to all these different people. Okay, you can find his work at on YouTube at High Res TV, also on X. 
formerly known as Twitter. It's at High Res the Rapper. And the newest song is Anti Everything on Bass Records. So check him out. Uh, I'm glad you're on the show. I'm glad you're doing what you're Thank doing. You. And uh, keep up the great work. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Woody's back. Yeah, Woody Allen's 50th film, 5 Oh, that's an amazing accomplishment. Coup de chance will be released, after all, in the United States, coming this spring. The film got some, I'd say, mildly positive reviews overseas when it was released there. But as you know, Hollywood canceled Allen after it remembered that his daughter accused him of molesting her, after initially ignoring those accusations. What changed? Oh, me too. Remember how Justice finally caught up with Harvey Weinstein? Well, the Me Too mob was angry and alive and alert, and they wanted more scalps. And it didn't matter whether you were guilty or innocent or even somewhere in between, like Aziz Ansari. That meant Hollywood finally took Dylan Farrow seriously, and they kicked Alan to the curb. No more movies, no more screenings, no more adulation. Sorry, Mr. Allen, you're done. Even some actors who worked with Alan in recent years all of a sudden pretended they were aghast at their own decision. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. Some even gave their salaries back to appease the Me Too mob. Why would I call it a Me Too mob? Why am I angry at this movement? Wasn't it a good and necessary thing? Yeah, absolutely. Completely necessary. Completely appropriate. And that's why I'm angry. Because they blew it. And that can't be said enough. The movement became a political cudgel, of course. Trump? Monster. Biden? Innocent. Believe all women? You must. Well, you know, when we say believe all women, what we really mean is... <sighs> unbelievable. But the final straw, of course, came with Governor Cuomo of New York. He was accused of sexual allegations. He was mis using his power. He was making women within his organization feel uncomfortable. So how did the Time's Up organization deal with that? Of course, that was the group that formed after Me Too began. They were going to right the wrongs. They were going to protect women. They were going to make things different in our society. Well, Time's Up cozied up to Cuomo. Hey, let me, let me help you wash away those allegations. Just vile. And no shock, the organization crumbled shortly thereafter. So that was then. This is now. You've got a U.S. distributor who's going to make Woody Allen's latest film available in American theaters. And that's good. You know, we may never know if Dylan Farrow is telling the truth about her father. Never. Woody's done some creepy things in the past. I don't have to explain that away. His moral compass is bent, if not completely broken. He's also innocent in the eyes of the law. Remember when that mattered? His cancellation, let's be clear, was unjustified and hypocritical. Remember how a few years ago Hollywood stood in rapt attention? They gave Roman Polanski a standing ovation when he won an Oscar for The Pianist? And then suddenly it wasn't cool to cheer on a child rapist. And yes, Polanski is an admitted child rapist. He said it. Weird, right? Huh. Well, now Time's Up is gone. Roman Polanski is essentially gone from polite society. And the cultural fever over Me Too broke broke a few years ago. If Woody Allen wants to make a movie, I think we should be able to see it. Now, Me Too, in a sense, became part of cancel culture. And anytime cancel culture loses, that's our gain. Oh, and about that Groundhog Day trivia question. Every morning, Bill's... <laughs> Every morning, Bill Murray's character wakes up to a clock radio playing the song, I Got You, Babe. It's the signal that he's about to relive the same day again. That song, of course, is from Sonny and Cher. I Got You, Babe, topped the music charts in 1965. And, of course, we know that they broke up a few years later, but they got back together one last time on television to sing that song, and they looked like they were having a good old time. The year was 1987, and the show, Late Night with David Letterman. Well, that's it for the HitCast this week. Thank you, of course, to Radio America for having me as part of their great podcast lineup. 
and we'll have your attention. I hope you'll drop by HollywoodInToto.com. I update it seven days a week with news and reviews. You've got all the different commentaries on the wacky world of Hollywood. It is, like this podcast, the right take on entertainment and woke-free since 2014. See you next time.